So Alicia, thanks for coming. <laughs> so she's the CEO of one of the most important Internet of Things companies in Spain, actually. No? So yeah, welcome. Hello. Adios. Okay, well, thanks everyone for coming and thanks for inviting me today. Um, I'm going to speak about the IoT from a perspective of experience, or I'm going to try to do that. So, this is our vision, so this is what the future is going to look like, right? And this is the idea that we have, this is how we understand the IoT. And this is very aligned with the vision of Claro Partners. There's not going to be one, one single company leader in the market. And we have seen that there's not going to be one single technology either. When we started bike in 2006, it seemed that everything was going to be SIGVIN. And now we've seen that GPRS, 3G, and Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, but even NFC and RFID are technologies that can play in the IoT. So we are technology agnostic, and the vision that we have is that a platform should connect any kind of sensor using any communication protocol to any information system. And that's the thing that we've been building in the past seven years. So we have designed a hardware platform, which is called Wasmut, where you can attach more than 60 different sensors. You can attach all those communication protocols. And we have uh, built the connectors to to directly send the data collected to those cloud platforms like CEDA, Azure, but we are also working with um, Cyfly as well, as well, and we have some example with uh, the former Pats Bay. And uh, I used to have this slide without this last sentence, because I, it was till last year, or two years ago, when I thought that it was gonna be a, a matter of companies, the IoT. And now I have to add this sentence, which is so that anyone can play in the IoT. So we have a horizontal perspective. And when, when we started with the platform, we thought, well, if we have 60 different sensors, we will be seeing very, very soon the, uh, the most interesting trends in the market. Because very soon we will see that there are two or three sensors that are the most demanded by all the customers, and those are the sensors that we need to promote more because they are in the, in the more exciting segments. But still in 2013, that's not the truth. So this part, which is less than the 20% of the, of the revenues in sensors in 2013, groups more than 40 different references. It means there is no one single vertical outstanding yet. However, I'm, I'm going to be telling about three very clear trends we have identified so far. The first one are smart cities. This is not new, and this is not one single vertical either, because we do have a lot of different verticals here. But we are seeing that waste collection, smart parking, pol control pollution, and also the smartphone detection for giving contextual uh, information and to offer location-based services are, are being the most demanded applications. Of course, challenges, you are talking about doing things in a city, which is always very, very aggressive, because you need to cut streets, you need to, uh, you need to attach your own things to the existing infrastructures, which is always a nightmare. And those are some of the examples of the deployments we've done in cities like Santander, in Serbia, and that one was uh, Salamanca, and that's a laboratory in, in close to New York where we are also doing things. And I could say that when it comes to say the challenges in smart cities, uh, technology is the easy part, even although it's a nightmare. I've already said that. but. All the challenges when you are dealing with municipalities, when you are talking to politicians, are always very, very tricky. And it's even increased because citizens are taking part of this. 
this is the for the first time the citizens are have are really gaining empowerment and when when it comes to talk about the, the solutions that are being installed in the cities. The second trend is agriculture, and this is very very big. So. Those are images from Galicia and also in Oregon, in, in the United States. Um, we have sensors, we are monitoring here, um, even things that I didn't know that could be measured, like uh, using dendrometers for measuring the, the, the thickness of the trunks in the, in the vines to control the amount of humidity that is uh, flowing to the, to the grape and to control the sugar. And the most interesting thing here is that we are seeing the most clear return on investments in all the uh, scenarios we are working. So only by controlling temperature and humidity, you can detect a very huge, a very large number of uh, potential illnesses in the vines, and you can reduce the amount of fertilizers. So we have one case that the uh, investment was covered, was returned in just uh, four months of uh, fertilizer savings, which is pretty interesting, I think. And of course, uh, I think the pictures speaks by itself when it comes to challenges. Um, this is the first time that where this is one of the most mature and ancient markets, markets that, ex that exist, and we are trying to introduce the latest technology. So. It's a challenge in terms of, uh, of conversation with the potential customers and also in, the, in terms of the ruggedness of the solution. You need solar panels, you need to waterproof enclosures, you need a very, very robust solution. And last but not least, makers. We have uh, an open hardware and do-it-yourself division which is called Cooking Hacks and it works inside Livellium, where we are doing communication modules for, for Arduino and Raspberry Pi and also, well, many, many other stuff, but basically that. And this is one very interesting thing we did last year. We launched one eHealth sensor platform. So basically, with, um, it's a, one sensor board that you can attach to Arduino or to Raspberry Pi, we are offering a, a, a bridge for doing that. And it comes with 10 different sensors. The total cost of the briefcase, it's uh, less than 400 euros with all the sensors. So I thought, it's going to be very expensive. It's an expensive toy when the guys from R&D bring this to me. But, uh, I was not really understanding the, the huge potential of, of this because it's not individuals, the ones that are buying this, are prototyping companies, the ones that are interested in these kind of things. And when it comes to talking about democratizing the technology, I think this is a very good example because you know that if you want to start a company, you have a lot of barriers. But if you want to do that in the e-health industry, the, those barriers are even higher because all the sensors, all the things that you can use for prototyping are very, very expensive. So you don't even can go to a, to a venture capital to raise money because you don't have a prototype. So at least two companies are raising money right now with products that are based on this. So I think that this is when someone is asking me for democratizing technology, I think this is the, the best example. This is another example. We made a, when the Fukushima accident happened, we released a radioactive uh, um, sensor board to be attached on Arduino. And we were sending some of these samples for free to Tokyo hackerspace and some other hackerspaces. And, and we put the rest just yes to cover costs. So we just did that. But a couple of weeks later, it, there was something amazing happening. All the individuals with one Geiger counter were uploading the data into Patch Bay, 
and they were sharing the information with the rest of the people. So it was like a self um, maintained and totally independent from the government and from the media, radiation uh, sensor map. And I think that this demonstrates that the power of citizens is huge. And we are seeing that uh, there is a new kind of citizen, which is called the activist citizen. And this is not the only project, of course. You have the air quality, uh, the air quality, air quality egg project, uh, just to measure the air pollution in cities. It, it's just the same idea: distributing sensors in citizens that are willing to share their the, their measurements with the rest of the people, just for good. And I want to finish. Well, those are my colleagues from Cooking Hacks. Um, why is this happening right now? And, and I think that this is my, this is my formula. Um, we have things that we didn't have five years ago. We have crowdsourcing platforms that are really democratizing the technology and the possibility to, to make a company. We have 3D printers and we have open hardware. So now you can prototype one thing, you can even print uh, a prototype similar. You could prototype the thinking things uh, cubes with a 3D print. Maybe you actually did. Yeah, it's so I think that's the, the most beautiful thing when it comes to, to makers. And, and I think that at this point it's absolutely impossible to uh, neglect the, the play that the, the role that makers are going to be playing on this. That's what I have.